But before that, I need to talk about today's sponsor, and it couldn't be more fitting that the grand finale of Enterprise's story is brought to you by Curiosity Stream. Curiosity Stream is actually my favorite streaming service, with award-winning films and documentaries on literally everything. Just name a subject, science, technology, health, food, sports, the military, and of course, history. Lots and lots of history. In fact, I edited the majority of this video while watching their documentaries on my second screen. They have an almost endless selection of exclusive content that you can't watch anywhere else. I struggled to pick my favorite documentaries, but I highly recommend Blood Money, a deep dive analysis of the German war economy during World War II, and also the excellent Pioneers in Aviation series. There's also a great documentary called Supersonic Women about the fierce rivalry between two daring aviatrixes for the title of fastest woman on earth. And they add new content like this every single week. It really is the best deal in streaming, but for you dear viewers it gets even better. If you go to curiositystream.com forward slash Anamaki or click the link below, you can get unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and non-fiction series. And if you use promo code Anamaki, you can get 25% off. Honestly guys, to go off script here, I'm an actual customer of these guys. It's worth both your time and your hard-earned money. They have saved what remains of my sanity during the long grinding hours of editing, so trust me, take this opportunity, you won't regret it. Just click the link below or go to curiositystream.com forward slash Anamaki to save 25% and you'd help out the channel. And of course, thank you to CuriosityStream for sponsoring this video. But alas, we must return to the story as the climactic finale of Enterprise approaches. Empty. The hangar decks were empty. The ocean around them was empty. And their nation's cause, empty. Admiral Ozawa on the bridge of Zwikaku scanned the horizon, seeing nothing but the small task force around him. So this is the mighty air fleet of the Japanese Navy, he thought bitterly. One full-sized flight deck and three escorts. Total number of aircraft? 116. Command had even been so gracious enough to assign him the Issei-class hybrid battleship aircraft carriers to make up the numbers, yet no one had thought to give him any aircraft with them. Not that they had the pilots to fly them anyway. This trip was going to be one way. A glorious final battle to force a decision in the field. Then again, we've had several final battles now, haven't we? There always seems to be one more. But not this time. Zwikaku and the pilots aboard her represented the very last of Kido Butai, and even then most of them were replacements. The few experienced pilots they had left were either promoted to command far earlier than one would expect or require, or walking wounded holding instructor's positions. 
In the last two weeks alone, the Americans have destroyed over 500 aircraft, a third of those with their crews. Very soon, we're going to be flying with cadets in biplanes. That's why Command recently approved the long-discussed plans that, up until now, were deemed too desperate even for them. Kamikaze. The Divine Wind, which blew away the invading Mongols centuries before, would now blow again, at the cost of Japan's youngest, best, and brightest. It could work, of course. If their carrier fleet could draw the Americans away, it could give his colleagues in the battleship force an opening to hit the enemy fleet anchored offshore. Admiral Kurita was in command of Yamato and Musashi, the mightiest warships ever to sail, with every battleship, cruiser and destroyer Japan had left in support. The resulting slaughter would rout the US Navy, and it very well could give the island garrison a chance, forcing the Americans to the negotiation table. It could work. But was it worth the huge cost they would inevitably pay doing it? Well, that isn't up to me, is it? After the disaster in the Marianas, the odds against them couldn't be clearer. By October 1944, Task Force 58 numbered over 100 ships, with a corps of fleet carriers named Murderer's Row, led by Admiral Mitchell aboard USS Lexington. Across the entire invasion force currently conducting operations, 300 American warships of all types stood ready for action, with an air wing numbering over 1,500 aircraft. This mission was doomed. Their chances were nearly zero. Yet, as wise men in the grim far future so often say, the Emperor protects. With a little bit of luck, raw audacity, and a well-timed bout of American stupidity, things may just go their way. And still, to this day, 80 years later, no one can really believe just how close they got, nor can they believe what the Americans pulled off to prevent it. In the American camp, meanwhile, things were not as monolithically terrifying as it appeared. Due to the nature of the operations they were carrying out, the chain of command was a complete mess. Simply put, because they were conducting an amphibious invasion of the Philippines, unlike all the major naval operations previously, they fell under Douglas MacArthur's jurisdiction. Therefore, half the naval forces were under his command, while Third Fleet, Task Force 58 and the heavier fleet assets were all under Admiral Halsey, who was in turn under Admiral Nimitz. And while the heavier assets were primarily there to counter any Japanese fleet operations, they also had to do double duty, supporting the troops assaulting the islands with air power and shore bombardment and all the support missions. So at any given time, no one was really sure who was in charge of who or what their primary objective was. Now it must be said that this was nowhere near as catastrophic as some of the other chain of command structures we've seen, but it must be mentioned because it will help explain why there are a lot of crossed wires, miscommunications and misunderstandings between the different elements of the US task force later on. But of course this was not a concern of the aviators of USS Enterprise. They had their hands full, being the only real fully night capable aircraft carrier on a 24 hour flight roster, responsible for night patrol, combat air patrol and close air support for the landing force. It was a hellish operational schedule, but in recent days it had gotten particularly bad. After the air campaign against the Japanese air forces throughout the Pacific, followed by the invasion of the Philippines, the US carrier force had expended a considerable amount of ammunition and fuel. Given that the invasion was now well underway and the Japanese had yet to appear, Admiral Halsey detached a large number of his carriers with orders to return to Alithi Atoll for resupply, leaving only five fleet carriers on station. Franklin, Intrepid, Lexington, Essex, and of course, USS Enterprise. That said, however, they did have a large number of smaller carriers in support of the landings assigned to Task Force 77. The Taffies, so they'd been called. Thus, they should have enough aircraft to handle any contingency. But of course, having fleet carriers in the double digits is always preferable if you have the option. And so here it is. The US main force is under strength, their command and control is degraded due to conflicts in the chain of command, and the largest battleship flotilla ever assembled is now stealthily passing through the Philippine archipelago in the middle of the night under complete radio silence. The Japanese, by complete accident, and they had no way of knowing it, had against all odds 
managed to catch the Americans at just the right time for their plan to work. Now all they had to do was catch them by surprise. Enemy spotted. Oh dear. At 1am on the 23rd of October 1944, two US Navy submarines, USS Data and USS Dace, were cruising through the Palawan Passage on the surface, patrolling the sea lanes leading to the main invasion area. They were on their way back to the beginning of their patrol beat when Data's radar operator picked up a large surface force on their scope. It was in the direction of the US fleet, but no surface units were supposed to have come out this far. They were 30,000 yards away, cruising steadily eastwards. The radar operator strained his eyes to make sure what he was seeing on his scope was correct. He counted 30 returns in all, and at the centre of the group he saw the two biggest returns he had ever seen on his scope. It had to be a glitch, these couldn't be this big. He fiddled with the settings, but nothing changed. Dace and Data turned to pursue and went to all ahead full, their diesel thundering to life as the submarine slowly accelerated to full speed. Data submitted a contact report to 3rd Fleet Command, while the bridge officer manning the conning tower got a visual with his binoculars. What he saw, he couldn't quite believe. In the darkness, he saw a group entirely composed of surface combatants, no flat tops, and in the middle of the formation he saw two hulking shadows which dwarfed all the other vessels around them, their pagoda silhouettes blocking out the moon. Admiral Kurita, commanding centre force from Otago, had made it this far without being noticed. As per the operational planning, he had gambled that Admiral Ozawa's northern force would be spotted first and draw the Americans away from his movements, giving him an opening. But unfortunately, it hadn't worked. The Americans had spotted his group first. He had heard their contact report go out, but he was still under strict orders to maintain radio silence. That, and if they were focused on attacking him, maybe Ozawa could get in close enough to attack the American LSTs with his surviving air group. Then again, he had both Yamato and Musashi with him, as well as Nagato, Kongo and Haruna, not to mention a full escort force of cruisers and destroyers. If there was any surface group in the world that could put up a fight against the overwhelming might of the US Navy, it was his. And so he pressed on into the dawn. But as the sun crested the horizon, there came a loud scream from the bridge wing. Yorei! Data and Dace had moved ahead of the Japanese formation during the night, and as the sun came up, they had enough light to launch a submerged torpedo attack. Otago took four hits and began to sink almost immediately. There was barely enough time to call abandoned ship before she began healing over. Admiral Kurita was forced to swim for it. There wasn't even time to organize a launch or a raft. As the fleet came to battle, stations and destroyers began fanning out to locate the attackers. Another set of explosions could be heard from Otago's sister ship, Takao. Both US submarines had hit their targets. Though Takao only took two hits and managed to enact damage control measures in time. The Japanese ships went to all ahead full and began evasive maneuvers. The destroyer Kishinami, who was nearest to the flagship, immediately began rescue operations. Admiral Kurita was quickly fished out of the water and transported to the relative safety of Yamato, giving orders to find and engage the submarines to ensure that the battleships could get away safely. He couldn't lose those ships. He had to move quickly and he had to get a handle on this situation. But as he gave the order, while the rescue for Otago's crew was underway, yet another Japanese ship, the cruiser Maya, exploded in a ball of flame as four more torpedoes from Data slammed into her port side. This time they had hit one of the magazines and within five minutes she had capsized and plummeted down, taking over 300 men with her. The US submarines had just fired the opening shot of the largest naval battle in human history, having sunk two heavy cruisers while crippling a third. And as the Japanese destroyer screen began their hunt, both Data and Dace made a quick but stealthy getaway, linking up with none other than USS Nautilus as they did so. Things had started badly for the Japanese, and spoiler alert, it's uh, gonna get worse. <laughs> oh, it's gonna get so much worse. <laughs> Admiral Halsey, having received the contact reports from Data, immediately organized his forces for an interception. Task Force 58 was put on alert, with some of the ships that were sent back to Ulithi being recalled. The battleships, meanwhile, were prepared to face off the enemy surface units in the San Bernardino Strait, should the enemy maintain their advance through the air assault. 
This group was to be designated Task Force 34, under the command of the big man himself, Admiral Willis Ching Kirishima I Don't See Her Lee who I am certain was salivating at the possibility of taking down history's biggest ever warship. Given the relative distance of the two forces, plus wanting to take stock and get organised over the course of the 23rd of October, no combat took place. But US recon aircraft maintained their patrols, searching for any other Japanese units which they knew had to be out there. The Japanese were very obviously making their big play, and they definitely have more ships than just centre force. And sure enough, they spotted Admiral Nishimura's southern force, comprised of battleships Fuzo and Yamashiro and their escorts. He was making his way through the Surigao Strait, a pincer movement attempting to overwhelm their defences and hit the landing force. With Halsey's forces moving to intercept Kurita and centre force, it fell on the 7th fleet and the older battleships to handle that threat. However, Nishimura, due to the radio silence, had absolutely no idea whatsoever that anything was amiss. They were under orders to keep radio silent, so no one had told him anything. As far as he knew, Ozawa's force was on schedule, and Kurita was sneaking into the Sibian Sea, though he suspected that the Americans would eventually spot him. Hopefully, his colleagues could draw off the enemy long enough to get through, though. He pressed on with confidence, completely unaware that the survivors of Pearl Harbor were even now working up their crews. Their boilers were alight, their magazines standing ready. The old and venerable battle wagons of the mighty US Pacific Fleet, who were thought to be dead three years ago, were ready and eager to get some well-deserved and thoroughly righteous payback. And so, as radar-equipped scouts shadowed the enemy forces throughout the night, the stage was set for the US Navy's aviators to do that voodoo that they do oh so very well. Futures now, old man. As the morning of October 24th, 1944 dawned, the Pacific's morning calm was actually anything but. Across Task Force 58, every vessel, big and small, was a hive of furious activity. The entire rainbow could be seen sprinting to and fro across the crowded flight decks. Purple shirts running hoses, red shirts rigging ordnance, yellow shirts unfastening tie-down chains and moving aircraft into position. To the untrained eye, it seemed like panicked pandemonium, but to those who know, it was a perfectly choreographed dance performed by men who had been on combat operations for months, with its only accompanying music being the relentless general quarters alarms sounding throughout the fleet, as all crewmen donned helmets and manned their battle stations, with thousands upon thousands of 20mm AA guns being turned skyward for the attack they knew would come. And it was definitely coming. After being hit the previous evening, Admiral Kurita knew that the swarm was about to descend upon him, and that without support he was going to get obliterated. Breaking radio silence, he had contacted the surviving air units based on Luzon, led by Admiral Onishi. Orders were given to assemble every land-based aircraft available to attack Task Force 58, with the goal of crippling the enemy carriers while taking pressure off the surface force long enough to allow them to get through and into gun range. Admiral Onishi, who would later be known as the father of the kamikazes, was more than happy to oblige, assembling 180 to 200 aircraft of all types for the mission to be launched in three waves. Unfortunately for them, however, as per standard operating procedure, the first flights launched from each carrier was the combat air patrol to cover the fleet during standard operations. Thus, they will have to fight their way past, just as they had to do in the Great Marianas turkey shoot. That said, due to half the US fleet having fallen back for resupply and the necessary repositioning to counter Curita's advance, the Americans would have to launch their attacks group by group rather than in a massed formation. Intrepid was first in line, launching her air group alongside the CVLs Cabot and Independence. They quickly formed up and set a heading towards the Japanese battleships at full speed, with the rest of the US carriers prepping for launch as they left. But the Japanese would get the first hit in. At 7.50am, the radar pickets detected an initial attack wave launched from Luzon. 
VF-20 from Enterprise turned to engage along with the other elements of the Combat Air Patrol, but it would be the boys from Essex who got there first, and to call it murder would be charitable. By now the Japanese had finally relaxed their training standards. They were desperate for new pilots after the devastation of the past two years. The only men available were a bunch of raw recruits led by a very small cadre of survivors, some of them from as far back as the initial invasion of the Philippines. In fact, some of them had even bombed the airfield they were now taking off from three years ago. But all that experience, excellent though it was, was by now not enough to compete with the sheer technological and numerical superiority of the enemy. Over the next hour, the Japanese attack force was obliterated, with one pilot from Essex, Commander David McCampbell, shooting down an incredible nine Japanese planes in this one battle alone. But as the second Japanese wave started to arrive, several aircraft managed to slip through the screen and board in on the task force, preparing to brave the storm of steel that would come up to meet them from the combined firepower of a thousand radar-guided proximity-fused armed AA guns. However, there were several scattered cloud formations over the fleet at the time, and one of the few veteran pilots of the Imperial Japanese Navy used them to great effect. USS Princeton, alongside the other light carriers, was prepping to strike the Japanese surface group moving in to attack the invasion force. As such, she had her strike aircraft fully fueled and in the process of being armed up for the strike. The Hellcats she had on combat air patrol, meanwhile, were coming into land after engaging the first wave of attackers, and so both her hangars and deck spaces were full of aircraft in all various stages of operational evolution, just as the Japanese had suffered at Midway. Bursting out of a cloud bank above her, a single D4Y Judy dove in for the attack. The defensive guns blazed away, but the enemy had gotten within range too quickly to respond. A 500-pound armor-piercing bomb slammed through the deck, detonating the fully armed aircraft inside. A huge explosion rocked the ship, killing over a hundred men before secondary explosions and fires started ripping through the rest of the vessel. The initial shock was so devastating, it broke the fire suppression system. USS Princeton would eventually sink, with a main magazine explosion detonating while rescue operations were underway, killing and wounding hundreds of men, while severely damaging several surface combatants in the process. The Japanese pilot never knew of his success, though, as a Hellcat from USS Lexington blew him out of the sky soon after his run. A small victory won at great cost. Of that entire Japanese wave, not a single aircraft survived. But it wouldn't take long for the Americans to reply. Kirita had heard the alarm sound, but it may as well have been a routine weather report. It was just as inevitable. Aboard Yamato, the AA guns barked to life, but being Japanese anti-aircraft guns, the US naval aviators simply moved in between the fire zones as the primary radar gun director for the Japanese gunners was a man holding a stick yelling aggressively for the Emperor. Which if he has a bolter in the other hand is perhaps worth some consideration, but in this case he didn't and thus it wasn't. The Hell Divers began peeling off and picking their targets while the Avengers steadily formed up their formation torpedo attacks. Naturally, the Americans aimed for the biggest ships they could see, which of course were the two largest warships ever built, even now maneuvering hard to evade. It wouldn't help them, especially as the second wave from Essex and Lexington were now beginning to arrive as well. Musashi, Nagato and Yamato all took hits from the dive bombers, with a 500 pound bomb smashing through Yamato's deck near A turret, doing notable but not significant damage. Musashi, however, drew the focus of the attackers. Across several hours, she was pummeled by the air groups of Intrepid, Cabot, Essex, Lexington, Independence and Langley, with at least 10 armor piercing bombs and a torpedo barrage slamming into her from multiple directions, causing her to take on a list to port while wrecking the superstructure and starting multiple fires. Damage control teams rushed to extinguish the flames and get the flooding under control, but there would be no escape because there was one more wave of US Navy aircraft inbound, a wave led by a vengeful spirit no enemy had managed to withstand. The two largest warships in history may have been among the strongest vessels afloat, but they weren't the deadliest. The deadliest was at that moment beginning her assault. Ah! 
Enterprise ready? Engage! Let's go. USS Enterprise's pilots circled Musashi like vultures, with USS Franklin's pilots folding in behind them. They were the last to arrive due to the fact that while Intrepid and Essex had initiated the attack on Center Force, Enterprise and Franklin had attacked the approaching Southern Force, with Enterprise's dive bombers scoring multiple hits on both Fuzo and Yamashiro. Now she had come to finish what her little sisters had started. The Japanese sailors fired everything they had, but it was in vain as the Grey Ghost's Avenger pilots slammed several torpedoes into Musashi in a lethal coordinated attack. At the same time, the escorting Hellcats armed with rockets caused a magazine explosion on one of her destroyer escorts, sinking it instantly, while the Hell Divers of both carriers began their runs. Enterprise scored at least four bomb hits on Musashi, causing a number of secondary explosions and starting an enormous fire amidships. Franklin's pilots, meanwhile, added to the inferno with their own barrage of bombs and torpedoes. With everyone able to see that Musashi was mortally wounded, the remainder of Enterprise's pilots settled on the cruiser Miyoko as their secondary target, dropping the remaining ordnance on the cruiser, crippling her to the extent that she had to withdraw from the battle outright at half speed. Over the next hour, the Hellcats emptied their guns into Musashi, and as Enterprise's pilots left the scene, Intrepid's pilots returned to ensure her demise. By 1530, Musashi had been blasted apart, her forecastle awash, her bow down in the water to a critical degree. Kirita, realizing that Musashi was almost certainly doomed, ordered several escorts to stay with her and assist in rescue should they fail to save the ship, which of course they would. Dead in the water, with severe flooding, the order to abandon ship was given. And as night began to fall, the once mighty battleship that bore the name of both an ancient province and Japan's mightiest warrior capsized and sank. Coming to rest over 4,000 feet below the waves, her captain still on the bridge by his own will. Kirita analyzed the situation from Yamato and drew a stark conclusion. The operation had failed. He withdrew west away from the combat area to reassess and consider disengaging. He was down half his firepower without even getting close to the enemy's main force, and in the face of such opposition, retreat is the only sensible decision. But that was not going to be an option. Ozawa and Nishimura were proceeding on mission. They would enter the battle by tomorrow. Even if it does put the flagship of the Japanese Navy at risk, strategically and especially politically, he can't sit this one out. Thus, as the sun set, Kirita turned back around and headed towards the invasion beaches. And once again, unknowingly, he had against all odds swung the battle back in his favour. And unless you already know this story, I'm sure you're sitting here confused, wondering how is that even possible given the odds? Well, at 1640, about an hour before Kirita turned round, Admiral Halsey had confirmed that Center Force was running west, they were running away. It was then that his scouts finally detected Admiral Ozawa's force coming in from the north. In a rather ironic twist, the only Japanese force that had managed to sneak up on the Americans was the one that the entire plan hinged on being found first. It was then that the old Bull Halsey made a fateful decision. Ozawa's flagship was Zuikaku, the last Japanese fleet carrier that struck Pearl Harbor still in service. It was also, as far as he knew, the only major Japanese air threat left in the area after they'd killed all those aircraft from Luzon. With the loss of a Yamato-class battleship and seeing Kurita heading away from the area, Halsey concluded that the main axis of attack wasn't Kurita anymore, but Ozawa, and that he needed to reorient his forces to meet the threat while finally settling accounts with Kido Butai once and for all. However, this kicked off a cavalcade of disastrous miscommunication and bad intelligence all round, 
which I will give you the short version of. Going back to the start of this battle, when the battleships were approaching, Halsey organised Task Force 34 under Admiral Lee to guard the San Bernardino Strait against further attack, his Iowas forming an unassailable wall of steel and 16-inch guns. And so, when he gave the order to move north and engage Ozawa's carriers, everyone assumed that Task Force 34 was to maintain its position and defend the strait, just in case Kurita turned around. However, because Kurita had withdrawn, Halsey decided to bring the battleships as well, to see if he could get close enough to wipe out Northern Force in its entirety and sink everything. Thing is, due to all the chain of command issues, poor radio communications in this region of the Pacific, and a few problematic, slightly adversarial interpersonal relationships, no one told anybody. And so the San Bernardino Strait was left completely unguarded. Now it's bad enough this is happening by accident, but what's really incredible is that pretty much every other senior officer, including Lee and Mitcher, took one look at this and said, that's bait. Which was very soon confirmed by a nighttime recon aircraft from USS Independence, who saw Yamato heading back east towards the invasion fleet. But again, due to the all aforementioned nonsense and shenanigans, this report was completely ignored, and so the entirety of Third Fleet headed north to fight the last major carrier engagement in the Pacific War, leaving a small assembly of destroyers and escort carriers to fend off the largest battleship flotilla in human history. A ragtag bunch of tin can sailors was all that stood up against Yamato and her escorts. They only had tiny 5 inch guns, relatively inexperienced crews, and only a tenth of their normal air support. The Japanese never stood a chance. Over on the other side of the Philippines, however, things were, surprisingly and amazingly given the nature of war, actually going according to plan. Task Force 77 had assembled an absolute monstrosity of a battle group to confront Southern Force, comprised of six battleships, five of which having been revived after Pearl Harbor, eight cruisers, and 28 destroyers, backed up by a screening group of over 40 PT boats. Nishimura was walking into what can only be described as, using scientific terms, an absolute of an ambush. At 22.30 on the 24th of October, PT-131 made contact with the Japanese, sending a contact report back to the main force. Once that was done, the PT boats formed into their squadrons and began a ferocious assault on the Japanese as they sailed through the strait. And things just went downhill really quickly from there. Nishimura has had his fair share of bad days. He commanded part of the escort force at Midway, which he then followed up by leading the 7th Cruiser Squadron through Guadalcanal. Rough days were not an uncommon thing. But today, oh man. And the worst part was, it would be his last day ever. The PT boats kept hitting Southern Force for the next several hours, but Yamashiro and Fuzo were able to keep them at arm's length, allowing the formation to dodge the avalanche of torpedoes sent their way. Problem was, the PT boats were just keeping them busy and keeping them in sight while maintaining an accurate plot on their position. As the Japanese advanced, they were falling deeper and deeper into a closing noose, as just beyond the PT screen, was the entirety of the destroyer force. And once they got into position, they made the torpedo spread of their smaller colleagues look like a joke. And at 3am on the 25th, both Fuzo and Yamashiro took multiple hits, with Fuzo stopping dead in the water. That ship had so many onboard fires, it looked like Sunrise had come early. Given Fuzo is another name for Japan, it seems they took the land of the rising sun a bit too literally. Well, um, actually at this point that starts to become a theme, but anyway, Fuzo took such a beating some people thought it had split in half and reported it as such, but nevertheless it capsized and sank within the hour, with USS Melvin scoring the killing blow. 
Meanwhile, Yamashiro took most of the hits in her main belt, so she could still steam on right ahead, just fine, straight into the radar-directed guns of an entire battle line of American battleships who had, for the last time in naval history, crossed the T of their enemy. USS West Virginia detected Yamashiro as she and her surviving escorts pushed through the ambush, and once the Japanese got in range, John Denver's biggest hit song was completely invalidated, as there was absolutely no such thing as almost about the heaven Yamashiro sailors suddenly found themselves in. West Virginia's first salvo slammed into her, followed by a literal wall of shells from her colleagues. California, Tennessee, Pennsylvania, and Maryland sent shell after shell alongside Weavey. Nishimura's force was systematically and completely annihilated. In fact, they were cut down so mercilessly that by the time USS Mississippi, the last battleship in the line, got in range, they only fired one salvo, which is the last time a battleship has fired at another battleship in naval history. Admiral Nishimura was killed, just dead, just straight out blown away, his ship Yamashiro torn down to its individual components. Her escorts were likewise obliterated, among them the heavy cruiser Mogami. Only one ship, one singular ship, the small destroyer Shigure, managed to escape the fiery hell that the Americans had unleashed upon them. The battle was so viciously one-sided that the second wave of Southern Force, that's right, there was another wave behind them, took one look at this situation and decided, nope! quickly turning tail and running west as fast as their propellers could turn. As the sun rose on the morning of the 25th, it looked as though it would be a complete clean sweep for the US Navy. But, off the island of Samar, through the now unguarded San Bernardino Strait, Curita's centre force was thundering forward at full speed into a small force of destroyers and mini-carriers, setting the stage for the only success the Japanese would achieve in this battle, while simultaneously guaranteeing their defeat. Because unbeknownst to the men aboard battleship Yamato, they had just picked a fight with the US Navy's biggest ever task force in terms of displacement. 90% of that displacement being the uh, testicular fortitude of the men in it. A task force containing the two mightiest warships the US Navy has ever fielded, USS Johnston and the Samuel B. Roberts. Sir, they have an entire flotilla of battleships out there. Their tonnage has us beaten five to one, and they're all fresh. These are truly fearful odds. Oh, that we had here now but one ten thousand of those men back in the States that do no work today. What's well, he that wishes so? <laughs> well, well. None other than my dear Admiral Sprague. <laughs> no, Admiral. If we are marked to die... We too. We too are enough to do our country loss. <laughs> and yet, yet to live. To live. The fewer men, the greater the share of honor. God's will I pray thee, wish not one man more. God's peace, I would not lose so great an honor as one man more methinks would share from me. So please, please do not wish for one man more, Adam. Rather, proclaim it, proclaim it all throughout my command, that he which hath no stomach for this fight, let him depart. Let him depart. His passport shall be made, and his transfer orders put into his pocket. We want to die in that man's company that fears his fellowship to die with us. This day, this day is called the Feast of Crispian. 
He that outlives this day and comes safe home will stand a tiptoe when this day is named and rouse him at the name of Crispian. He that shall live through this day and see old age will yearly on the vigil feast his neighbors and say tomorrow is Saint Crispian. Then he will strip his sleeve and show his scars and say these wounds I had on Crispin's day. Old men forget, yet all shall be forgot, but he'll remember, he'll remember with advantages what feats he did that day. Then the names of our ships Familiar in his mouth as household words, Samuel B. Roberts, Johnston, and Hall, and Hiraman, White Plains, Fanshawe, and St. Lo, be in their flowing cups, freshly remembered. This story is a story the good man shall teach his son, and Crispin Crispian shall ne'er go by from this day until the ending of the world, but we in it, we in it shall be remembered. We few we happy few we band of brothers for he today that sheds his blood with me shall forever be my brother be he ne'er so vile and this day shall forever gentle his condition and gentlemen back in america now abed shall think themselves accursed they were not here and hold their manhoods cheap whilst any man speaks that fought with us upon this St. Crispin's Day! Soaring through the early morning sun at 0630, Ensign William Brooks in his Avenger was scanning the horizon when he saw a surface force approaching from the northwest. Why was Halsey back so soon? Did the Japanese carrier group disengage? He turned his aircraft towards the approaching force to see what was up, and he called in the sighting, only to get a really confusing response. No friendly vessels in area, report inaccurate, establish direct visual contact. This order came from Admiral Sprague himself, who received the report and didn't believe it. Someone's going to be playing games or screwing around, or they're just not calling their movements. He would have to file a complaint to Nimitz later about whatever idiot was out there. Halsey went running off like a cowboy and he's forgotten someone most likely. Or maybe he's realised his mistake and sent a force back so we aren't hanging out here with our butts in the wind. That'd be a first, and it'd also be pretty nice. But no, it was neither. Ensign Brooks flew closer, and what he saw confirmed what he thought his eyes were lying about, which was quickly followed by a wall of anti-aircraft fire. Admiral Sprague heard the strained response through the receiver personally. I see pagoda masts and the biggest meatball flag on the biggest battleship I ever saw. Holy crap. Those Japanese battleships had turned around in the middle of the night and were now tearing towards his escort carriers, who were almost completely defenseless. Worse still, they were all prepped for launch in a support configuration, meaning they had ASW, CAS, and air superiority loadouts. Very few of them were armed for anti-shipping operations, as it was thought that Task Force 58 had dealt with the threat. That, and they were supposed to have a heavy surface battle group watching the straits in front of them. We can't stay here, and we sure as hell can't let those battleships and cruisers fire on full carriers. If just one shell hits the hangar bays, the entire ship will go up. Order everyone to launch with whatever they have, and hit that surface force. HE bombs, death charges, BB guns, I don't care. And then turn us east as fast as we can go. We need to draw them away from the transports and towards the fleet. However, Sprague realized in horror that they had gotten within 20 nautical miles of the outer elements, and while the rest of the group would be able to break contact, Taffy 3, the outer picket, would not. Taffy 3, being on the outside, only had depth charges fitted to its aircraft for ASW. There was nothing they could really do to stop the largest battleship in human history, which was even now turning its guns towards the carriers. They tried dropping their depth charges on the lead cruiser in the formation Kumano, only for them to harmlessly bounce off and fall into the water. There was nothing for it but to throw all their 50 cal at the destroyers and cruisers in the hopes that they could do some damage while waiting for backup. It was then that something terrifying occurred. 
Due to Taffy's air wings having been spotted taking off, Kurita had reorganized into an anti-aircraft defensive formation, only to realize now that he was actually in attack range. His force was spread out in different groups rather than the concentrated battle line that he would normally be in for a surface engagement. Now, for the Americans, this was good news for the carriers, as it meant only the battleships and heavy cruisers could really shoot at them, while for the destroyers, it meant that they could maneuver to meet their threats individually. The bad news was that it meant Kurita had no choice but to order a general fleet attack, meaning that the entire Japanese force would kick it up to all ahead full and pursue them until point blank, blasting every single one of them into little itty bitty pieces. Congo, who was out on the northern side, joined up with the cruisers to support them against Taffy's aircraft, who are now beginning to bully Suzuya and Kumano quite ruthlessly. Haruna, Nagato, and Yamato, with their destroyer screen and battle column, began closing in, and then... Yamato opened the battle, and the fight of all of these sailors' lives was now on. Admiral Sprague ordered the destroyers to make as big a smokescreen as they could and then run for the rain squalls that were brewing nearby. Trying to meet a cruiser squadron, two Congos, a Nagato, and the Imperial flagship in open battle was not possible. It would be damn near suicidal and any efforts to do so would be of little use. Throw five inch at them if you get the chance to throw off their aim, but for God's sake, just run. But the rearmost escort facing down Yamato didn't feel like running. Captain Evans stared at the pagoda mast in the distance, firing 18-inch shells straight at him and thought, If I can turn about with enough speed and utilize the smoke screen, I reckon I could just about get into torpedo range of the lead element. His ancestors in the Cherokee hadn't run from the British Empire, and they were the biggest power on Earth at the time. So if this new bunch of imperialist pricks thought they were going to get him to turn tail, he was going to have to correct the record. He turned to the helmsman and gave the order. Flank speed, full left rudder. Mr. Hagen, you are clear to engage. The destroyer, USS Johnston, a ship less than a tenth of the size of just one of the Japanese ships, turned directly into the path of the entire enemy formation, almost crossing the T. However, it was halfway through the maneuver when Evans realized they wouldn't be able to pull it off, and so he had to make a decision. And given the circumstances, there was only one thing for it. Fix bayonets. USS Johnston immediately swung towards the nearest enemy ship, which was the lead cruiser Kumano, and charged, firing every single gun she had. Five-inch shells began raining down on Kumano's superstructure, wrecking it completely both from the over 45-inch impacts and a raging inferno on deck, started by the sheer volume of fire Johnston was throwing her way. And worse still, Johnston was at that moment turning to fire her torpedoes. Upon witnessing this insanity, Admiral Sprague knew that Johnston, against all odds, had seized the initiative and moved to act on it. He ordered the other two destroyers in his screen to follow her and attack the enemy with everything they had. The destroyer Heerman was on the other side of Taffy 3's formation. They went to flank speed immediately, ducking and weaving between the aircraft carriers to get into position. While leading the attack was the flagship of the destroyer screen, USS Hull, who circled around to link up with Johnston. But as Heerman tore past, something rather incredible happened. A destroyer escort, the smallest ship class in the Blue Water Navy, immediately went to flank speed and formed up with the other two ships. The escorts, as their name implies, were ordered on pain of death to stick with the carriers. They had absolutely no hope in this fight. In fact, the destroyers are only here out of desperation and the stupid bravery of one of the commanders. And yet, here came USS Samuel B. Roberts, under the command of Lieutenant Commander, that's right, these ships are so small, they don't even get a captain to command them. Lieutenant Commander Robert Copeland, sailing into harm's way against the biggest battleship in human history. To put it in perspective, just one of Yamato's turrets has more weight displacement than their entire ship. His reasoning was simple. Due to the fact that they were Johnston's wingman in the formation, they were in perfect position for a torpedo attack. And that given their small size, the chaos of battle, the smoke screen, and the rain squalls nearby, they could probably get right up on the Japanese without them noticing. And thus the bosun's whistle blew as the cannonade of battle rang out around them when Commander Copeland addressed the crew. Gentlemen, this will be a fight against overwhelming odds from which survival cannot be expected. So we will do what damage we can. 
And so the tin cans charged after Johnston into the maelstrom, all guns blazing except for Roberts, who held fire to remain unnoticed in the confusion, hoping to get as close as possible. At that moment, a huge explosion shot up from one of the Japanese cruisers. Kumano had taken a direct hit from Johnston's torpedo attack, and the resulting explosion had torn her bow off completely. Suzuya, meanwhile, was faced with the entirety of Taffy's air groups, relentlessly pounding her with whatever they had to hand. Literally. One of the pilots threw his map case, an oxygen canister, and an empty coke bottle at various Japanese ships. The two cruisers were forced to run north, while Congo was forced to launch a countercharge as Hull's torpedoes stormed towards her. This wasn't a battle. This was a melee, a fistfight in the mud during a hurricane. As Taffy's air group started forming up for their next attack, the tin cans rolled in further, firing their five inches at anything they could hit. Johnston was wrapping back around to screen for the other ships, and as she did so, she fired at the most direct threat to her, which was none other than the battleship Yamato. However, the flagship responded in kind. Three 18-inch shells slammed into Johnston, followed by three 6-inch secondary shells into the bridge wing. Captain Evans's left hand was severely mangled, while a number of the crew had been killed or wounded. However, due to the fact that they had been firing literally everything at the Japanese while going flank speed, Johnston was actually quite light on combustible materials, and so she didn't immediately go down. In fact, the Japanese, erroneously though it was, gave Johnston the compliment of reporting the destruction of an enemy cruiser, as no destroyer would be able to do the amount of damage they had just seen. But Johnston wasn't dead. Oh no. Johnston, while the Japanese shifted targets, snuck into a nearby rain squall currently blinding Congo and got her systems back online, because Johnston and her crew didn't hear no goddamn bell. Meanwhile, Samuel B. Roberts had gotten into torpedo range undetected, not so much as a secondary had been fired at her. And now the crew aboard selected the Japanese cruisers Chokai and Chikuma as their targets. It was then that the Japanese spotted her. This tiny little ship they would use as an armed fleet tug, this pathetic little thing, was now charging towards them. At that moment, Lieutenant Commander Copeland gave the order he had been denying for the past 20 minutes. Mr. Burton, you may open fire. The little destroyer escort started emptying her guns at the enemy cruiser, while closing not just a point-blank range, but knife fighting range. They got inside the minimum range of Chokai's guns to the extent that the enemy couldn't depress their secondaries low enough to engage her. It was then that the lookouts aboard the Japanese ships cringed in horror as they saw the large splash and silvery trails of Mark 15 torpedoes heading straight towards them, and they were far too close to evade. Chokai's stern was blown off, crippling her completely, removing her from the battle as the Roberts ducked back into the smokescreen. And if you think that's metal, here is the insane part. While all this was going on, USS Johnston thundered back out of the rain squall, charging at the Japanese once again. That's right, in the 10 minutes it took for this drama to commence, Johnston's damage control teams had been working frantically and got all their systems back so they could rejoin the fight. And who did this absolute bunch of mad lads go after? Well, it was none other than another battleship, specifically Harana who incredulously saw a destroyer closing to gun range and firing. And what's more, that gunfire was effective. Fifteen hits were scored on her superstructure starting fires, all the while buying time for Heerman and Hull, who were launching torpedoes which resulted in forcing Yamato to evade away from the fight temporarily, buying the carrier's much-needed time to attempt to escape. And with that, let's talk about the Naval Aviation Division, as we're supposed to be talking about Enterprise, and trust me, as this is going on, she is engaged in her own drama. But I do want to mention the naval aviation contingent of Taffy 3, as they get a little overlooked in the retellings of the events, despite being just as giga-chad as their surface colleagues. But as a last word on the tin cans, let me say this. As I recount the rest of these events, for the entire time I talk about them, just know that in the background, a small group of four or five destroyers throughout the entire story are locked in mortal combat with several battleships, their destroyer screen, and a heavy cruiser squadron by themselves. But with that, let's talk about the pilots. The aviators had been pummeling the cruisers and destroyers throughout the morning, strafing, bombing, dropping death charges, throwing odd bits and pieces out of their cockpit. 
They had done some serious damage as well, though not fatal damage. But that damage wasn't just restricted to escort vessels. Kalinan Bay's air group was scattered after an emergency launch. A pilot from St. Lo overheard this conversation. This is Georgia 1. Any other Georgia aircraft up? 8-4 here. I'll join on you. What you got? Anti-personnel bombs? Yeah, me too. What do you think we should hit? Probably one of the destroyers. Well, I'm the flight lead, and I think we should go hit a battleship. Won't do y'all much good. If you're scared, you can try landing on the carrier. God damn it, I'll go anywhere you go. And so they did, making runs at Congo, who was sailing behind the cruiser screen. However, as the day went on, the Taffy pilots steadily ran low on fuel and ammunition, being forced to find an airfield. They couldn't land on the carriers, as they were currently under direct fire from the cruisers now tearing towards them. But those carriers weren't the helpless targets the Japanese expected. The escort carriers all had a 5-inch dual-purpose gun mounted on the stern for this very scenario to engage surface targets while trying to break contact. And the carriers of Taffy 3 were at this very moment yeeting shells downrange as fast as they could load and fire them. And they were scoring hits. Lots of hits, in fact. The superstructures of the Japanese cruisers were getting absolutely battered again and again, and while they too were doing damage to the carriers, they weren't doing enough. Not even their torpedoes were working. The Americans were dodging every one they threw at them, and the ones they couldn't dodge were shot out of the water by Taffy's planes. You heard correctly, the pilots of Taffy 3 dove down to zero feet to strafe torpedoes. The whole of Taffy 3 amounted to just one of the Japanese ships in terms of displacement, and yet each man on each ship was fighting like a lion. If you want to know what the mood was, the anti-air gunners aboard the carriers sat there watching their 5-inch colleagues firing at the oncoming Japanese, and they weren't scared. No, it was the opposite. They were angry they couldn't join in. So they sat there fuming while their trigger fingers itched, until one of the officers called out, Don't worry, boys! We're suckering them into 40 mil range! But the problem with planes is, they run out of ammo and fuel a lot faster than a ship. And landing on the carriers while under shell fire, as mentioned before, is not advisable. They needed to divert. But Task Force 58 was on their own adventure and unable to lend support or provide temporary flight decks. Thankfully, however, the army had seized a number of forward airfields in the Philippines during the invasion. Tom Lupo, from the Fanshawe Bay Air Group, was leading a motley crew of Taffy pilots, having run out of ammo and fuel, when he noted that the recently captured airfield of Tacloban was open. The engineers and CBs were just starting to clear the field of debris and fill in craters caused by the Navy just the previous week. Lieutenant Lupo landed his Avenger, dodging potholes and rolled to a stop near the command tent. He then immediately ran over to the CBs and told them to grab their bulldozers and whoever they can grab with a shovel to clear the field for his fellow aviators. It was then that he spied piles of ammo, tons of bombs, and hundreds of barrels of fuel that had just been dropped off. Who's in charge of that? he asked, and was immediately referred to an army major. The army major in question told Lieutenant Lupo that these stores were for the Army Air Force squadrons scheduled to arrive within the next few days. Well, the entire Japanese Navy is out there, and if we don't use those bombs, they're going to sail over here and blow you to hell. The army major was still nonplussed and told him that he couldn't have them unless he cleared it with his colonel, who was commanding troops at the front. To which Lieutenant Lupo drew his pistol and said, Well, I'm not going to bother the man, he's out fighting a war like me, so that's just too damn bad. He then pointed the pistol at the officer and handed the pistol to his stunned radio man with instructions to cover him. He then climbed into his aircraft and radioed Fanshawe Bay to direct all friendly aircraft to Tacloban for rearm and refuel. The army anti-aircraft gunners welcomed them for a few moments before being yelled at to stop. However, the strip was still very, very rough, and the first aircraft attempting to land hit a rough patch and went over on its nose. Thankfully, with the crew all okay, though. The other aircraft waved off, only to be radioed by an army air controller, who had been joined by a navy aircraft director who had been put ashore with the invasion force. These two men saved the day, coordinating the safe recovery for most of the force. There were some concerning moments as a trio of Japanese Zeros strafed the field in the middle of landing operations, but other than that, there were no major incidents. What happened next was the same miracle of American military personnel forced to improvise that we have seen all throughout their storied history. 
This group of enlisted personnel and junior officers, on the spot with no warning or structure, organized a fluid rearm and refueling point for the entire Taffy Air Group, turning aircraft around and quickly deploying them back into the fight. The field was rapidly cleared for safer landings, and even battle damage was fixed, with one of the crews raiding the Avenger who force landed for a new wing, which they then fitted to their aircraft, rearmed, and headed back out. US Naval Aviators and Air Force Maintainers God himself could not fashion a more lethal team for projecting air power. However, some Taffy pilots were still on station. Blue Archer, in his Avenger, was preparing to head back to the airfield for more fuel and ammo. It was then he heard the call for a torpedo attack. Now, he didn't have any ammo or fuel, but he did have guts and some friends. And so, to draw the fire from the other aircraft and the aircraft carriers, he opened his bomb bay and began doing low passes with his wingmen over the Japanese task force. It was then he saw Yamato turning to rejoin the fight. So with his two wingmen, he turned in to make a low pass over the ship to draw their attention away from friendlies. It was then that a wall of AA shattered his engine and blew away the Avenger on his left wing. Wounded, concussed, and completely, absolutely, unbelievably livid, Archer opened his canopy for better visibility, and as he flew past Yamato's bridge, drew his pistol and dumped the mag straight at the superstructure, with Admiral Kurita staring back in sheer amazement. After this move, the air attacks died down briefly as the Americans returned to rearm. While they departed, Admiral Ugaki was heard to remark on the bravery of the pilots, which left many of the Japanese officers in a state of disbelief alongside Kurita. But their bravery, though Herculean, would not outdo that of the Japanese aviators for a divine wind was blowing. The first kamikazes of the Pacific War had arrived on the scene. They attacked different targets throughout the entire Taffy formation, with their leader, Lieutenant Yukio Sekai, slamming his Zero into St. Lo, causing catastrophic damage that would result in the loss of the ship. Other kamikazes struck targets causing chaos, but most were shot down before they could even get close. It would be the only air support the Japanese would get. And so the battle raged on. The tin cans waged a war of heroic yet spiteful resistance as the carriers tried to escape. But against a force of battleships, the result was never in doubt. In desperation, Sprague passed calls for help up the chain of command, begging for any kind of support from Task Force 58, but none was within range to assist. Nimitz, having thought the Iowas were nearby to assist, fired off an encrypted communication to Halsey, Turkey trots to water. Where is Task Force 34? The world wonders. The answer to that, of course, was nowhere near enough to help. By the end of the engagement, St. Lo and Gambia Bay had been sunk. Heavy cruisers Johnston Hall and Samuel B. Roberts along with them. But due to their sacrifice and their heroic efforts, along with that of the Taffy aviators, the majority of the formation broke contact and survived to fight another day. Yet even as they made good their escape, Yamato and her surviving escorts were now tearing towards the invasion fleet. They had defeated Taffy and were within striking distance of the objective. The Americans were helpless. All they needed to do was press the attack. And so they turned hard about and broke contact west. Admiral Kurita ordered a full withdrawal and to abort the entire operation. Taffy's resistance had been so fierce that it had inflicted significant damage on his entire force, including Yamato. Furthermore, he had burned through far more ammunition than he would have liked, and there was now no air support, not even kamikazes to back them up. If he sailed in there, he may very well score a few more kills, but it would almost certainly result in the loss of his entire formation like Southern Force, as the rest of the US fleet would thunder in and crush him before he could get away and losing both of Japan's mightiest flagships in a single battle would be both a strategic and political disaster. No, Yamato must live on as a final bastion to defend the homeland. Thus the Japanese offensive came to an end. But a question still remains unanswered, and like the world, I'm sure you're wondering. As this drama was playing out, where was USS Enterprise? Well, the answer to that is as fitting as it is poignant. While the drama of Samar played out, Enterprise and her sisters were far to the north. They had sailed at all possible speed, and as the sunlight broke the horizon that day, 
Their airmen took flight for a singular purpose. To settle accounts once and for all. Admiral Ozawa was once again not having a good day. Honestly, this man just keeps taking L's wherever he goes. Were it not for what's to come, I would say he's the real tragic figure here. Hearing what happened on the 24th, he had rightly concluded that the plan was a bust, and as a result he should withdraw to preserve his force. However, like with Kurita, orders came down that everyone was to turn around and re-engage. They were going to accept battle against the Americans. Now, in his case, that meant taking his force, comprised of one air group of 120 planes, Japan's remaining carriers, and his hybrid surface warfare group, up against the entirety of Third Fleet. He had something like 20 ships in total, and that's including his support auxiliaries. The Americans, meanwhile, had over 100 ships hauling towards him, with 10 times the number of aircraft he did, not including the seaplanes and other auxiliary air units, as well as all of the Iowa-class battleships. As if it was any small consolation, their mission hadn't actually changed. Kurita was at this stage just about to hit Taffy 3, so he was bait, and in that sense his mission was accomplished. Now he had to hold the Americans here for his colleagues to do their work, and that would mean spending the lives of his pilots and sailors to do it. Well, it was going to come to this sooner or later anyway, and such was their duty. As dawn broke, the 30 Zeros of Zuikaku's combat air patrol launched into the rising sun, while the strike package behind them loaded weapons. Zuiho's pilots had already manned their planes and were waiting for the flag officer to give the word, and as the sun broke free of the horizon, the Japanese launched. They knew where the Americans were, they were hard to miss with a force that size, and so the strike formed up. But as they moved out, they detected American scout aircraft within visual range of the task force. Here they come. The two strike packages passed each other on their way to their respective targets, but only one would reach their objective. As the Japanese pilots approached Task Force 58, the combat air patrol descended on them like a pack of hungry wolves. American radar and fire control was just too effective. Enterprise's pilots from VF-20 scored five kills from the ensuing fight, while the other aviators of Task Force 58 steadily began slaughtering the Japanese. Of the entire attack force sent, not a single one got through the perimeter defences of the task force. However, several of the more experienced pilots aborted their attack, and they would later strafe Taklaban during the Battle of Samar, that was that group of three zeros earlier, eventually joining the kamikazes for one last attempt at victory. The Americans, meanwhile, had no such problems. The first wave of US Navy aircraft arrived over the Japanese force. The Japanese combat air patrol bravely tried to mount a defence, only to be scythed down by escorting Hellcats as though they were nothing. It wasn't without results though, 1-0 did manage to shoot down an Enterprise Avenger, however the pilot was rescued by seaplane promptly afterwards along with his crew. With their only defence gone and only a small group of ships to provide AA fire, they were now at the mercy of the Americans, who would show precisely none at all. Bombs and torpedoes began raining down on every ship in the group. Issei took several near misses and a small bomb hit to one of her turrets, while a destroyer was completely immolated by Enterprise's pilots with a rocket barrage. But they weren't what most of the air group was aiming for. No, they were aiming for the carriers. Zuikaku and Zuiho, in the center of the formation, maneuvered to escape. One more time, the Grey Ghost and the sole survivor met in battle. And it would be the last time. Wave after wave of aircraft struck the Japanese. The near misses alone caused shock damage to almost every ship in the formation, but the carriers and seaplane tenders were sentenced to certain death. The aircraft from every ship in the US fleet pummeled the Japanese flat tops, and it seemed that Enterprise would finally vanquish her nemesis. It was the end. She'd finally, after all these years, she'd finally won. But there was no glory, no honour, no triumphant final battle. No, 
It was merely an execution for a long-defeated adversary. Yet as they stared each other down, it would not be Enterprise who settled it. As the third wave crested the horizon towards the Japanese, at its head was none other than the air group of USS Lexington. Her namesake, her mothership, her predecessor had perished at Zuikaku's hands. She would answer for that death, and Zuikaku would answer to her. The last survivor of Kido Butai, the only ship left to stand against the oncoming storm, a mirror to her rival in so many ways, was helpless to save herself. Bomb after bomb smashed through her flight deck as no less than seven torpedoes smashed into her hull. Her anti-aircraft defenses were useless, along with Zuiho fighting for her life alongside her and failing. The situation was well and truly hopeless. At 1358, the order to abandon ship was given, with Admiral Ozawa transferring the flag to the cruiser Oyodo. Her surviving crew gathered on the starboard side of the flight deck, which was now the only part of the ship above water, and officially struck the ensign in a ceremonial parade. Even as bombs and torpedoes were dropping around them, a mark of respect and honour for this valiant ship who had been their home for the past five years. This done, they dropped their gear and jumped over the side, with the ever-worsening list aiding their departure. The Americans, seeing that she was finished, switched targets and started hitting every other ship in sight. Chioda was bombarded repeatedly, while even more pressure fell upon Zuiho. But all of that faded into noise, as at 1414, the moment finally came. Zuikaku, the auspicious crane, capsized and slipped beneath the waves by the stern, taking her captain and 842 men with her. And as she fell to the ocean floor, the only thing she could see was the twisting and writhing hull of Zuiho, who she knew would soon be in her company for all eternity. The airstrikes continued the submarines of the US Navy closed in like a pack of hungry wolves, but it was this moment more than any other that tolled like the final bell. Kido Butai, the force which struck at the heart of freedom, was finally no more, and history's largest sea battle was over. And though Halsey would be criticised for leaving the rest of the US fleet unguarded, the heroics of the tin can sailors and the US naval aviators had turned the odds in their favour and achieved a total victory, though there was never really any doubt of the outcome in the end. The Japanese navy had launched its last gasp, and they had suffocated. It was now time to tighten the noose. With their only defences down, it was time for the final phase, and there was only one place for Enterprise to go now. Tokyo. After a return to Ulithi for rearm and refuel, Enterprise and her sisters sailed unopposed across the length of the southwestern Pacific. With her air group being one of the few trained and equipped for dedicated night operations, she operated on rotating shifts, blasting Japanese positions all throughout the region, including targets in Taiwan, Macau, the Philippines and Vietnam. From airfields to army depots to strategically crucial infrastructure, all the while engaging and destroying any aircraft or shipping they came across. Throughout December and January, these efforts continued until Task Force 58 was tasked with one mission, the one objective that Enterprise's sailors and airmen had been waiting for since 1941. Their target in February was the city of Tokyo, specifically aircraft production and engine plants in the city. Task Force 58 was to conduct round-the-clock strikes, with the early morning and late night missions being flown by Enterprise. But she was not the only night carrier in the group, because Enterprise would be reunited with a very old friend. USS Saratoga, having completed night training for a number of US Navy pilots throughout Carrier Division 11, 
joined the force to assist in the upcoming operation. The task force fully assembled by February 14th, and two days later, the task force began hitting targets in the major cities along the eastern coast of Japan. Tokyo was hit along with naval installations at Yokosuka Naval Arsenal. Strikes continued over two days until the 18th. Once completed, they immediately sailed south to rejoin the main US armada, bombarding Iwo Jima to support the upcoming invasion. Enterprise and her colleagues arrived on station just in time to support Uncle Sam's misguided children, who were wading ashore just as they began flight operations. Throughout the campaign to take the island, Enterprise began flying constant strikes and combat air patrols, many of them against Mount Suribachi as our favourite Crayola canines slogged their way up its slopes. Enterprise here would set yet another world first record, conducting constant flight operations without a break over the span of 174 hours. Enterprise's pilots were literally flying a week straight with no break. She stayed in this role until March the 9th, when she left a resupply for an attack on Kyushu, the southern island of the Japanese homeland. Sorting again, she conducted strikes all across Kyushu and Honshu in precision night raids, pioneering radar-guided bombing attacks against crucial industrial targets. She sustained light battle damage on the 18th, but it was inconsequential. She then proceeded to support the landings on Okinawa, which is where her tour of duty would ultimately end. From April 5th to April 11th, the aviators of the Big E flew constant sorties in support of the Marines working their way across the island. Conditions were horrible and the resistance fierce. It was then that the last great naval operation conducted by Japan took place as... sailed forth to make her final stand. Enterprise, however, was not involved, as by now there were so many Essex-class carriers present that her specialist night pilots had, quite literally, a million better things to do than to blow up the world's biggest battleship. Because Enterprise is the true queen of these waters. However, not even queens can defeat Mother Nature. The weather proved hazardous for both naval and air operations, but there was one storm that was worse than any other. The Divine Storm. The kamikaze had begun in earnest. Wave upon wave of Japanese aviators threw their lives away in the hope that they could achieve critical damage on enemy ships. And those that managed to get through the defences inflicted horrific losses on the Americans. Proper countermeasures to the threat were still in the process of being developed, some of them very creative. One such ingenious idea was the creation of smokescreen buoys to be dropped by support vessels in order to shield the ships from view, while allowing the radar-guided AA guns to engage and destroy the oncoming attackers at will. And one of the pioneers of this method was a ship currently overseeing a forward emergency repair station among the islands south of Okinawa, a ship that bore the name USS Vestal. On April 11th, a wave of kamikazes struck the carrier group anchored offshore. Enterprise was damaged considerably by two near misses, with the explosives aboard setting shockwaves strong enough to rupture her fuel tanks, damage her engines, and knock out power to numerous systems on the ship. However, the damage was not fatal, and under her own power, she limped back to Ulithi for emergency repairs. These were completed quickly, allowing her to return on station off Okinawa by the 6th of May conducting round-the-clock flight operations constantly for the next four days. In the time she had been absent, things had gotten worse. Kamikaze attacks had increased in frequency, and though damage had been heavy throughout the fleet, there were some incredible stories of bravery. One such story belonged to a ship named USS Laffey, she's back, who against all odds held off the assault of an entire squadron of kamikazes by herself and lived to sail away from it. Throughout the first half of May, Enti's pilots racked up the flight hours and took down kamikazes. The gun crews as well were getting quite proficient, adding to their tally quite regularly as the fleet came under attack. 
However, while Enterprise was the luckiest ship in the fleet, everyone's luck eventually has to run out. On the 14th of May, another wave of kamikazes hit Task Force 58. One Zero, flown by Lieutenant Shinusuke Tomiyasu, managed to evade the combat air patrol and braved through the ungodly fusillade of AA fire, taking aim at the nearest carrier he could see. The carrier he found was USS Enterprise. He aimed his aircraft towards the bow section, hoping to destroy the flight deck and knock out the ship. He slammed into the forward deck elevator, sending the elevator flying through the air. Thirteen men were killed in the attack, with another 68 wounded. Damage control teams moved swiftly to douse the flames and restore the flight deck to active use, patching the elevator hole and running diagnostic checks throughout the ship. Enterprise's captain said she was still combat capable and could continue operations. However, given that the entire Essex class was now present and available, it was deemed unnecessary to keep her there, and she was ordered back to the States for a full refit. As such, Enterprise, with the aid of local auxiliaries, checked out her systems, secured the decks, and set sail for Puget Sound, saying farewell to her old friend, USS Vestal, who was at that time aiding a pair of destroyers in the maintenance area while Enterprise handled her own repairs. They had been comrades through the darkest times, saving each other more times than either one could count. Enterprise and Vestal were sisters in arms through and through. And this would be the very last time they would see each other. CV-6, the Grey Ghost, pulled into Puget Sound on the 12th of June, disembarking her air group and her battle-weary crew. There was much work to be done, the ship was worn out. The crew had cared for her deeply, but there was no hiding the battle scars, the dents, the scratches, wear and tear. Nevertheless, the yard got to work, bringing her back up to the best condition they could in preparation for Operation Olympic, the invasion of Kyushu to secure the southern flank and forward base for the final part of Operation Downfall, the invasion of mainland Japan. It was going to be a brutal fight. Hundreds of thousands were expected to die. Purple Hearts were manufactured by the millions. However, those medals would not be awarded until 60 years later. As on August the 6th, a small flight of Boeing B-29s soared through the morning sun over the Pacific. Their lead aircraft bore the name Enola Gay. At 8.15, a bright flash enveloped the city of Hiroshima, leveling the city to the ground in an instant, extinguishing the lives of 100,000 people with it. An emergency meeting of the Imperial Council was called. However, the military was adamant the war would continue. They would force the Allies to invade. The Emperor, however, was not convinced. He, along with his aides in the civilian government, were looking for a solution. But their hands would be forced. As on August 9th, Nagasaki was struck by a plutonium bomb killing a further 40,000 people and destroying a key port in Kyushu vital for the defense. On the same day, Soviet troops invaded Manchuria, scuttling any hope for a negotiated peace via arbitration. Realizing the situation was hopeless, the Emperor declared his intention to end the war, and this actually resulted in an attempted coup by overzealous Japanese officers, along with multiple units defying the order to cease hostilities. But in the end, Eventually, the Emperor's will would be enforced. In his address to the nation, he accepted the terms of unconditional surrender established at Potsdam with the words, The war has developed not entirely in Japan's favour. A ceasefire was announced, and on September 2nd, 1945, aboard USS Missouri, Japan formally capitulated to the Allied powers bringing humanity's largest and most horrific conflict to an end. However, missing from Tokyo Bay and the air parade over the city was the ship who had done more to bring about this moment than any other. USS Enterprise sat in Puget Sound, her refit finished two days earlier. Her restoration, though, was now no longer needed. She was old, obsolete. And even with her new coat of paint, there was no doubt that with the end of hostilities, her career was at an end. But true to her fighting spirit, true to all the sacrifices she had made, true to all the men who served her to the last, 
she embarked on one last mission in service to the country, and it could not have been more perfect. USS Enterprise, the Grey Ghost, the Big E, the ship which had stood firm in America's darkest hour, was the ship that took America to war. And now, she would bring America to peace. And she would bring all those Americans home. USS Enterprise immediately began Operation Magic Carpet to retrieve as many US servicemen as possible and bring them back home to the United States. She sailed to Hawaii where she embarked 1,141 servicemen for the voyage home. After this was done, she sailed on to New York and later Boston, where she would have her aircraft support facilities removed and replaced with as many berthings as possible made to accommodate soldiers returning from Europe. She would make three voyages across the Atlantic, bringing over 10,000 servicemen and women back to the United States. On the second trip, she stopped in Southampton, where she was received officially by the British First Lord of the Admiralty and his senior staff. As recognition for achievements in battle and the friendship between the two navies, USS Enterprise was awarded with a Royal Navy Admiralty pennant, a symbol of distinction and the only US ship in history to ever receive the honour, capping off an illustrious and storied career. By war's end, USS Enterprise was the most decorated ship in US Navy history, as well as its most deadly. In her time of service, she had accounted for 911 planes and 71 ships by herself, while sharing in the disabling or the destruction of 192 further vessels of all types with her sisters. She was officially awarded both the Presidential Unit Citation and the Navy Commendation Medal with 20 Battle Stars to her Asia Pacific Service Award, more stars than any other vessel in the US Navy before or since. USS Enterprises only equal in American naval history is USS Constitution. That is the level of honor and reverence we are discussing. On the 18th of January 1946, Enterprise entered New York Naval Yard for decommissioning. It was originally intended for her to become a war memorial, to be cared for by the state of New York, but plans for this fell through and were suspended in 1949. This decision caused outrage among what amounted to the entire U.S. naval aviation community. Veterans of USS Enterprise campaigned relentlessly for her to be saved as a museum, even gaining the support of both Admiral Nimitz and Admiral Halsey. Eventually, the U.S. Navy gave them an ultimatum. The cost for the purchase of Enterprise from the Navy was listed as $2 million U.S., roughly $25 million in today's money. There was no way that they could raise enough. And so... In what I consider the worst and most sacrilegious crime ever to take place in naval history, USS Enterprise CV-6 was sold for scrap on the 1st of July 1958 to the Lipset Corporation of New York to be dismantled in the breaker's yard of Kearney, New Jersey. Several precious artifacts were saved though, such as her stern plate which rests in a park in New Jersey while her anchors are preserved in the Washington Navy Yard. Most prestigiously though, her ship's bell is held in pride of place at the US Naval Academy, and it is only ever rung if the midshipmen beat West Point in the annual Army-Navy game. But nevertheless, it was over. Her journey was at an end. From Pearl Harbor to Midway, to Santa Cruz to Guadalcanal, to the very gates of Tokyo she sailed, and now, her final resting place awaited her arrival. She passed through Manhattan, under the mighty spans of her bridges, and the towering buildings of a prosperous nation. A nation she fought so valiantly to save. It was not the end she deserved, but... There is a part of me that thinks it may have been the end her spirit wanted. And I cannot think of a more fitting place for Enterprise to rest. As she sailed to her last port of call, she passed the Statue of Liberty. A beacon of hope 
a symbol that she herself on her final mission had brought so many of America's finest to see, to let them know that they had come home. But, but it's more than that. As Enterprise slowly passed from this earth, she was overlooking New York Harbour. And in Lady Liberty, I think she actually found a kindred spirit in the end, for both of them had made a solemn promise that they would be a guardian, a watcher, a protector of the flame of liberty, ensuring that for all time, forevermore and without compromise, there will always, always be a land on earth where anyone can find sanctuary, where the poor and the oppressed and downtrodden, regardless of who they be, may once again breathe free. Oh, my God.